Hi, this is Dr. Kevin Kirby, coming to you from Northern California. I want to give another mini lecture, and this one is going to be on biomechanics terminology in regards to this term, viscoelasticity. So what is viscoelasticity? Every structural tissue of the body is viscoelastic, or has a property we call viscoelasticity. This includes bone, cartilage, muscle, tendon, ligament, and fascia, and also skin. So all of the body's tissues, all these structural tissues in the foot and lower extremity that we deal with as clinicians on a daily basis and trying to prevent their injury and heal their injury are viscoelastic structures. So let's learn more about what exactly viscoelasticity is. First of all, what does viscosity mean? Viscosity is the property of fluids that describes its resistance to flow over time. So we can see from this video here that we have this thick honey being poured into a little measuring cup. And we can see how if it was a more fluid flow, more like water, it would flow faster. And if it was even thicker than that, let's say like a cold molasses, it would come out even slower. So this viscosity determines the property of fluid that re describes its resistance to flow. Elasticity, on the other hand, is a property of solids that describes its ability to return back to its original shape once it's been loaded and then unloaded. And this elasticity is something that we're all familiar with, with many types of uh, objects, such as rubber bands and uh, other types of uh, metals that will bend and then return to their shape like a metal rod or a, a bend in a beam of uh, wood would tend to bend and then return to its original shape. But when we say something is viscoelastic, it means that it has a time dependent characteristic. That means that the length of time the force is applied to the material will change the strain of that material or the deformation of that material over time. Why would the body's tissues be viscoelastic? This is because all tissues of the body are not crystalline uh, in nature, such as a steel rod uh, or a piece of iron. It, they are though made of different component materials with two of the main components that we uh, must understand are these two very important components known as collagen and elastin. So here's a picture of the human skin. Here we have the outer layer of the epidermis. And within the dermis is these long straight collagen fibers and also we have these curly little elastin fibers in, in uh, this uh, skin structure along with what's called a ground substance. And this is gonna give our skin its ability to be elastic but also being viscoelastic, being able to deform over time. Collagen's a protein made of crimped fibrils that then aggregate into fibers. So here we have a single precursor to the collagen, which forms pro-collagen, a collagen molecule into a collagen fibril, and finally a collagen fiber. And here is a photomicrograph of a flexured tendon showing this crimp pattern or this wavy pattern that is present in all collagen. And this collagen crimp gives uh, the collagen fiber some of its elastic properties. So we can consider that these uh, collagen fibers are elastic and so that when we place it under load, in other words, let's take a collagen fiber and we strain it, in other words, we lengthen it and it's gonna have increased stress or increased force cross-sectional area of that material as we stretch it. We'll have the toe region where the crimp straightens out and then we'll have this elastic region where the collagen will first lengthen, and if we were to let go of it, it would return back to its original shape. However, if we go past this point here, where structural changes occur in the collagen fibers, let's say it's a tendon or a ligament, for example, we can get failure where we'll start to get small tears, then complete tears, and eventually a complete rupture of that tendon or ligament because of its stress-strain behavior where we're pushing these fibers of the collagen that are included within, let's say, tendon or ligament, past this point of no return to a point where it's gonna uh, partially rupture or completely rupture. 
So the primary function of these collagen fibers are to withstand axial tension in our ligaments and in our tendons. Elastin though is a little different. Elastin is made of these somewhat disorganized fibers that will stretch when they're placed in a load and they more resemble a rubber. Elastic fibers will go up to about two times stretch with a low stiffness. Once we get past two times stretch, they become stiffer. So this gives the tissues of our body a little more elastic recoil. Elastic fibers are a low modulus material. In other words, they will stretch easier for a given load. Whereas the collagen fibers, which have a little more stout structure, are going to be harder to deform and they're gonna show a higher elastic modulus, viscoelastic behavior. So you have the collagen and elastin acting as a high modulus and low modulus substance and components within our tissues that will withstand tension, but we also have to have that fluid component that allows us viscosity, and that fluid component is known as a ground substance. So if we look at the ground substance, we're gonna have this ground substance being this jelly-like fluid where we have then the collagen fibers running through it. We'll have the elastic fibers, which are shown here as being orange, coming through it, along with the, all the other cellular components of our tissues, including neutrophils, plasma cells, fat cells, lymphocytes, et cetera. This ground substance almost acts as a lubricant between the collagen elastic fibers so that their three-dimensional orientation within the tissues of the body help create this mechanical property of tissues that we call viscoelasticity. Well, there's many types of models for viscoelasticity. The earliest models of elasticity come from uh, James Clerk Maxwell, where we have the Maxwell element, where we have a dash pot, which is a viscous element meaning a fluid flow in a piston in a cylinder is going to be time dependent so that the faster we pull on that piston, the harder it's going to be able to pull that piston apart from its cylinder. And this is going to be in series with a linearly elastic spring. And then Lord Kelvin and a German scientist named Voigt had developed a Kelvin-Voigt model, which put these springs, this linearly elastic spring, and this dash pot or viscous damper into parallel to create this other model. So these are not the only two models, but this gives you an idea of how mathematically we may model viscoelasticity, not only in body tissues, but in other uh, types of materials that we deal with on a daily basis in our everyday world. So let's look at it, a few animations which may help us describe how this Maxwell model may describe something as simple as dorsiflexing the ankle and stretching the Achilles tendon along with the gastrocnemius soleus muscles. So if we have a slow ankle dorsiflexion here. What we're gonna be doing, if it's slow enough, we are going to be moving that piston in the cylinder without creating that much increased tension if we do it slow enough, and this, we're actually lengthening the muscle tendon unit here. And if we do a rapid ankle dorsiflexion, we are going to stretch that spring and increase the force. And then later on, if we hold it in place, it's going to allow that piston to slide on that cylinder over time. And this is the time dependent element. So slow ankle dorsiflexion is gonna produce less force and more stretch of the tissue. Whereas when we do a rapid ankle dorsiflexion, we put much more stress in the Achilles tendon. And these are the type of injuries that cause Achilles tendon ruptures, not the slow ankle dorsiflexion. So this time dependent behavior of our tissues, including the Achilles tendon I've modeled here, will determine the amount of force that goes through that tendon or that ligament or that bone or cartilage or skin or fascia. This may lead to more injury if these motions or deformations or stretches or bending of the bone are done too rapidly, causing more likelihood of injury. This demonstration I'm gonna be showing you here is a demonstration on silly putty. 
I think all of us have played with Silly Putty as kids and we've played with it and then know that it can bounce if we bounce it off a, uh, the ground, but it also can be molded into different shapes. But these viscoelastic materials will respond differently depending on how rapidly they are deformed. So let's look at the video. And we know that it will stretch and it's very ductile, isn't it? Well, that was a slow strain rate experiment that I just did. If I take the same Silly Putty, I haven't switched anything out, and now I deform it at a high strain rate, it's much more brittle. Thank you, Dr. Ruta. Great video showing and demonstrating the difference of strain rate, how a slow strain rate will allow this viscoelastic material we call Silly Putty to deform and become quite ductile and stretchy, whereas if we deform it rapidly, it actually breaks in half uh, having a very different characteristic. So we can say that these viscoelastic materials, including our tissues, including bone, skin, fascia, ligament, tendon, and muscle, are strain rate dependent. Two of the main properties, these time dependent properties that we should all understand as clinicians is this creep and stress relaxation. So this is characteristic of all tissues in our body. Creep is such that, if we look at this left-hand grain, that a creep response is when we take a ligament or tendon, for example, and we load it up to a certain load. Let's say we apply a 10-pound load to a, um, a ligament or tendon, and we keep it at 10 pounds. Initially, that ligament or tendon will stretch to a certain point, and if we keep that 10-pound load on the ligament or tendon over time, the material, this ligament or tendon, will tend to gradually deform more, it'll stretch more, and that's called creep. And this is time dependent. In other words, the longer we keep that load applied to that ligament or tendon, because of its viscous characteristics, it's going to tend to continue elongating, which is called creep or creep response. Stress relaxation, though, looks at the loading up of a let's say ligament or tendon, for example, to a certain length. So here we have loaded it up to a certain length and it's going to have a certain stress. So as we stretch, 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 we're going to get increased stress of the tissue. But if we keep it at the same length, what happens over time is we see this stress relaxation. In other words, the stress in the tissue goes down if we keep that ligament or tendon in a certain length. And that's because of the viscous properties of this ligament and tendon where it is tending to reduce its internal stress, its resisting force, the longer we keep it at that length. So these are two very important uh, items, characteristics, time-dependent characteristics that we should understand as clinicians and the tissues that we treat. So one good example of this stress relaxation would be our use of night splints to treat plantar fasciitis. So what do night splints do? Night splints will dorsiflex the forefoot on the rear foot, will put a dorsiflexion force at the ankle joint, and this will increase the tension in the plantar fascia. So over time, let's say we have a patient wear that all night, even though it's a low force, this will tend to stretch out the plantar fascia so that it will have a greater length when they wake up in the morning and they step down on the foot, they'll have less likelihood of having plantar arch or plantar heel pain because it's already been pre-stretched overnight by this time-dependent low force application to the forefoot where we've actually, here's my diagram I have made for you where I place a force on the forefoot from the night splint. The spring has is put in into a, a series with a dash pod here in the Maxwell model. And as we load it longer and longer, this dash pot will, piston will slide more in the cylinder, which will provide us with a um, longer plantar fascia. So in the morning when the patient wakes up, hopefully their first rest pain that they get from coming out of their bed and onto the floor and start walking, this will reduce the pain in their plantar fascia. And this is a good clinical example of stress realization that we all use for our patients that have plantar fasciitis. And one last characteristic we should understand about viscoelasticity is that elastic materials and viscoelastic materials behave differently 
viscoelastic materials are not as efficient, mechanically efficient, at absorbing energy and releasing energy when they're stretched and then released. So for example, let's look at purely elastic material. Let's look at something that's more like a steel bar. When we load a steel bar up and try to stretch it, it's gonna have more of a more of elastic curve where it's actually going to load and unload along more of a straight line. Our viscoelastic materials don't do that. When they load and then unload, they actually go up in their loading part of the curve in a different path than in their unloading curve. And as such, what we have is this energy absorption. In other words, the material, this viscoelastic material is absorbing energy and when it absorbs energy, it's at a lower energy return than when it, the energy that went in. It's such that the energy absorbed here by this viscoelastic material is going to reduce the amount of energy this viscoelastic material can return, which is shown as the red shaded area underneath the curve here. So that purely elastic materials, which uh, something like steel would be closer to elastic, will tend to return their strain energy much better than the viscoelastic materials since they have what we call this hysteresis loop where they'll actually lose energy when they load and unload, which will cause the, this hysteresis loop and it does represent a loss as heat energy. So if you do hear the term hysteresis or hysteresis loop, this is basically what we're talking about is that in viscoelastic materials, as we load and then unload the material, even though it may return to its original shape, it is losing much more energy in returning back to its original shape than a, a more elastic material such as a steel rod or a steel wire. So in summary, all the tissues of our body, including bone, cartilage, skin, fascia, ligament, tendon, and muscle are viscoelastic. This means that all these tissues will have time-dependent load deformation characteristics, which will include creep response, stress relaxation, and strain rate dependence. And we must remember that when we start talking about injuries in individuals, the higher strain rates that we would have, let's say from an injury where there's rapid dorsiflexion or rapid push off the foot, are much more likely to cause injuries in our tissues because the materials become stiffer as they deform faster, and this can lead to injuries. So we should all try to understand these load deformation characteristics, which are time dependent, that we call viscoelasticity in our body's tissues, so we can better understand how injuries do occur, how we can heal injuries, and, and the mechanical characteristics of the foot and lower extremity during the weight-bearing activities that we all perform. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed the mini-lecture. Hope all of you stay safe and well.